Good afternoon. My name is Ebony Grissom. I'm from First Baptist Church in Greenwich and Warwick Central Baptist Church in Warwick. I'm also a member of the steering committee. We're sharing, as you heard, some questions that have been raised from the table conversations. The first question is, how did you get Governor Romney and other leaders to meet with you? Uh, the question is, how do you get, how did we get? So you could get a meeting with your governor as well. Like, I think you meet with your governor pretty regularly, right? Uh, and you have, there are a number of elected officials here. I think you've had the speaker before. You've had the Senate president before. So I want to, I wanna, in answering that question, I want to teach a little bit. Thank you, Ebony, for the question. I want to teach a little bit on the difference between access or influence on the one hand and power on the other hand. You see the theme that keeps coming back. Um, often in life, and I'm in Washington, so I'm in the center. I live in the capital of access and influence. Um, I can get invited to the White House Hanukkah party <laughs> My mother is really proud of me. The president won't necessarily do what I want him to do. But I can get into the White House Sonic. You see the point, right? So lots of people in, our, in this room can get the meeting, can get the um, conversation, can get invited to the event or what have you. A lot of your constituents can as well. That doesn't mean that our elected officials who work for us will actually do what we want them to do. Um, because often, um, you get them into a room and you have enough of a relationship that you can either be heard, which is the whole, so access is getting in the room. Influence is your voice is heard, so like you know that they're listening. And then they're really nice to you. They're respectful, they're gracious, they thank you, and then they don't do it, whatever the it is. And the proof is in the data you just saw, right? If those data points would be different if you all had more power. Because I guarantee you, after your meeting with the governor, or the speaker, or the Senate president, or the mayor, or whoever, and this is not personal, it's not partisan, it's not Republican or Democrat, it's just life, it's politics. After your meeting is over, when they're really nice to you, and they've heard you, and they thanked you, there is some other entity that has more power than you, who is making other demands. And because in that power equation, they have more, you get less. That's politics. So I want to say two things about politics. Number one, and we shared this last night with um, the steering committee, what's the origin of the word politics? Who remembers, where does it come from? Polis, it's from the Greek polis, which means city-state. Even more evocative for you here in Rhode Island, which feels a bit like a city-state, right? It was the sacred art form, and I mean sacred on purpose. It was a religious enterprise by the ancient Greeks where the people would come together and ratify the decisions of what the community ought to look like. It was the origins of democracy. Now, I want to acknowledge it was only men, and it was only free men, because there were slaves in ancient Greece. So it was thousands of years ago, we'll give them a little bit of a break. But it was the sacred art form of decision making as a community. We need to reclaim politics from those who have stolen it from us and made it into a dirty word where it's about narrow self-interest, where it's about hyper-partisanship, right? We can actually lift up politics to a higher moral plane so that it becomes not power over, meaning I have it, you don't have it, I get to decide, but power with, right? So picture the healthcare campaign where you actually have organized labor and the Chamber of Commerce, where you have the providers and the insurers and the Republicans and Democrats. We modeled for Massachusetts how we can share power and create more power for everybody and lift everybody up. That's our job. One last story and we'll get to the next question, which really does explicate the difference between access, influence, and then power. So we got into a nursing care worker campaign where a number of our churches and synagogues were hearing lots of stories and concern about elder care and the broken elder care system. And we also heard from a lot of our lower income churches, particularly the Haitian churches, the mistreatment of workers in the Haitian community who are 90% of the certified nursing assistant community. And we realized there was a connection, the power with became about power with our members who had parents and aging frail elders in nursing homes and those low income workers who were the frontline caregivers who were mostly Haitian who were being mistreated, overworked, and underpaid. Well, because we had access, the president of our synagogue 
was the chief of staff to the attorney general. So he went to the president of the synagogue, my boss, right, because he signs my contract when I was a synagogue rabbi, and said, hey, can we get a meeting with the attorney general? Great, we got the meeting. The attorney general, he meets with us, Haitian leaders, Jewish leaders, Christian leaders, etc. We lay it all out, the attorney general says, oh, this is great. There's clear violations of workplace rules, and I will put you in touch with the civil rights division, and you know, I bet you we could release a statement that would put pressure on the industry, and we, we would change workplace conditions. Great, he said, when can we get that? I'll get back to you. Now, not only was the chief of his staff, President of our temple, one of the top uh, pastors in GBIO was also a Harvard classmate of the Attorney General. His name is Tom Riley, and this is all public record. So for months, we kept having uh, Reverend Ray Hammond, who was his Harvard kind of classmate, and uh, Dean Richland, who was our temple president, calling and calling and calling and saying, Attorney General, when are we going to get this advisory? Radio silence. Well, Riley at the time was running for governor. He was running against a guy nobody ever heard of named Deval Patrick. <laughs> and we learned, well, what do you think was happening? Why wasn't he returning our calls all of a sudden? He's running for governor. The nursing care industry was pouring money into his campaign. Power. So we said, okay, we're going to have 500 of our closest friends, leaders of our churches, our synagogues, and our mosques in a room, and we are going to publicly ask the Attorney General, demand that he do this. Think that he suggested, and he can either show up and be praised, or show up and say no, and we will call him out publicly, or he cannot show up and we'll call him out. And we had enough influence, enough access, that the Attorney General said, yeah, yeah, I'll come, and I'll explain it's complicated. You always know you're in trouble when an elected official tells you it's complicated. That's another way of saying, I'm not going to do what you want me to do, right? So we packed uh, Temple Salem of Dorchester and a Haitian church with 500 folks, members of all of our churches and synagogues. Uh, we have the Boston Globe in the room. We have all the press in the room. We've got TV cameras in the back, guys running for governor. Again, Reverend Ray Hammond calls him on his cell phone a half an hour before and say, you know, Attorney General Riley, it's a pretty tense atmosphere in here. We've got hundreds of people. We're, we're really going to push hard. Riley says, oh, I know Ray. I got it. Don't worry. I'll come. I'll explain it to your people. I'm not going to do what you want me to do, but, I, but it's important that I show up and I thank you for your leadership. Riley comes in the room. There's a seat for him in the front row. Uh, he walks in. The place is packed. We've been singing hosannas and hine matos and, you know, heard the Muslim call to prayer. And then the stories. Remember the stories, how important they are? One after the other, members of our institutions get up. I had a member of my synagogue talk about how she went to visit her mother in a nursing home and found her lying in her own urine because this frontline staff was so overworked and underpaid, there had been nobody to take care of her mother. And we heard these mostly women in the Haitian community get up and talk about how they came to this country to make a better life for themselves and for their children, but they are overworked and underpaid because they're considered undereducated, underqualified, and they get these jobs that they do out of sacred service because back in Haiti, it's considered culturally a sacred act to take care of frail elders. And the temperature is rising, the stories are coming out, and the, the, the heat of the room is, is, is feeling intense. And then one of the Haitian leaders gets up and says, Attorney General Riley, you have heard our stories, you know our concerns. We, the 500 members of GBO, representing 50 institutions, which is 50,000 voters in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in 25% of all of the Senate districts, are here to demand that you issue an advisory, advisory to the nursing care industry. So Riley gets up, and we are fully expecting that he's going to say, you know, I appreciate your leadership, thank you so much, it's complicated. And actually, my job that night was to give the calling out speech. The, we're very disappointed, Attorney General Riley, right? He gets up and he looks at the crowd, and there's this long silence. And he says, I want to tell you about my mother. My mother came from Ireland to Boston to make a better life as an immigrant for me and my siblings. And when she got here, she met a sign everywhere she went, Irish need not apply. And the only job she could get was scrubbing floors. And he said, when I look into your eyes, and he looked into the eyes of these hardworking Haitian women who had come to this country, he said, I see my own mother. 
and tomorrow I will issue an advisory to the nursing care industry. We're going to start cracking down the workplace rules. And the world changed for our workers, they changed for our parents, our frail elders, and for institutions. Now, I want to ask you, why did Attorney General Riley change his mind? What moved him? I'm hearing two right answers. One is the stories, right? He related to the stories. But were the stories enough? No, the stories were the love part. He also needed the power part. I think he knew when he walked in the room that his staff had given bad advice. Once he walked in that room and he saw the multi-ethnic array and the representative electoral leadership of Massachusetts, all of a sudden the power equation changed. So to me, it's not about how you get the meeting with the Attorney General or the, there will be somebody in the earth, you can get these meetings. It's what will you do with the meetings? Will you make the courageous choice, which is to put pressure and to create tension? Or will you just be invited to the next holiday party at the Capitol? Does that make sense? Okay, come on and ask the next question. Good afternoon, Rabbi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Jans. I'm with the Catholic Diocese of Providence. I'm also a member of the Coalition's uh, Steering Committee. Uh, this question is with regard to engagement of other stakeholders. Uh, specifically, how about engaging uh, media and engaging the business communities? Yeah, beautiful. Uh, thank you for the question. It's really important. So as a baseline, as important as it is to get deep into your own institutions, is to do an analysis, do a map of power in Rhode Island, and figure out who are the top 20 CEOs. Do we have a relationship with them? Who are the top folks in media? Do we have a relationship with them? Go meet with them early and often. Listen to their stories. Tell them your stories. Get into a negotiation with some of them. Some of them could become allies in some of your work. Some will become funders. Our healthcare campaign was funded by Partners Health, which is the monster in Massachusetts. Biggest employer in Massachusetts is our healthcare system. But they knew we were fighting for access, which would be good for their bottom line. By the way, then we got to a campaign on cost control. All of a sudden, they stopped funding us. It's okay. It's a public negotiation. Um, as a side note, we got into a Justice for Janitors campaign where we started, we, the union, the, uh, the janitors union came to us and said, will you, you know, stand with us, march with us, get arrested with us? And I said, wait a second, half my congregation owns real estate in Boston. I can't walk the picket line without going. I met with the real estate developers and business owners in my congregation, we all did this in our own congregations, who would be impacted by the, the strike we were gonna support. And we listened to them, and just hearing them, and hearing their perspective, and then in some cases we heard people say, look, I disagree with what you're doing, it's against my interest, but I appreciate that you came to me. You respect me enough to hear from me. I will not, I won't get in the way. One gentleman said to me, Rabbi, I realize I have made a lot of money in the real estate business in Boston, which has come at the expense of some people. How can I help? He was the guy I brought to the South Bronx. And he was the guy who wrote the huge check to do affordable housing in Boston. I would never have known that if I didn't go to him and say, listen, we're fighting for people to get, who get $8 an hour cleaning the bathrooms of your buildings, who don't have health care. We're trying to get them a couple dollars. How do you feel about that? Okay, last one. I'm Reverend Darren Colts from Green Baptist Church in Harrisville. I'm a member of the steering committee. And uh, it's a two-part question. What do you do about the I know a guy culture in Rhode Island? And uh, what does it mean to build a base? Fabulous. I, mean, I know a guy. Well, I think I started to kind of hint at the, the answer about the I know a guy culture. Um, because it's about access as opposed to power. The challenge when you have access the closer you are, the more it's about I know a guy, the harder it is to create tension. Because you're afraid of losing that relationship. But tension is a little bit like a rubber band, okay? You know how like if you pull a rubber band back, you insert a lot of tension into the rubber band? If you pull it too far, what happens? It breaks. But if you pull it just far enough and you let go, what happens? It can fly. So the question is, how do you go from being too afraid to create any tension to being courageous enough to create enough tension that when you let go, the thing will fly? 
Start practicing creating some tension with the guys you know. And get out of the habit of kind of like pats on the back and words of thanks and praise and get into the habit of public disagreement and public tension. That's okay. It's okay. We can withstand the tension. Great thing about being people of faith is we know how to polarize and create some tension, but we know how to depolarize, which is when we all have hold hands at the, at the end and pray. In a real way. In a real way. And the last thing, and this is the most important thing, is how do you build your base? The answer to the how you build your base, how you get deeper into, like I'm looking at the table, the Latino community that's here, the, what's that organization called? The Progressive Latino. The Progressive Latino base, or I'm looking at the, like we just heard from the Archdiocese. How do, you, how do you build the Jewish community, build the Jewish base? It's much longer of a process than I can say in the two minute answer. So what I would propose that you do is you have a wonderful, wonderful organizer. Where is your wonderful organizer, Ms. Jones? You have an amazing, seasoned, talented organizer who is a star, and you have a great leadership team. Go to them and say, challenge us and then train us. Teach us how to build our base. What are the one-on-one -on -one conversations we need to have with our top leaders? What are the house meetings or the small group conversations we need to have? What are the small actions we would need to take as a community to strengthen ourselves? How do we learn how to overcome the culture inertia and get proximate with one, each other and with one another and build our base across lines? There is a way to do it. And different organizations in different communities from Dallas to Chicago to Boston have learned how to do it. You can build on the great work you've done and learn how to deepen and broaden your base. It, it's, a, it's a skill that's teachable. So I'm going to now close because I have overstayed my welcome here in Providence. And I have got to get to Cranston. <laughs> that was a long drive. I am, I am going to leave you with the following story that comes out of the biblical text and then the rabbis who teach the story. So you know right now in the Jewish world, we're halfway between Passover and Shavuot, right? Which is the counting of the days between when we received the Torah, uh, when we um, were freed from Egypt from our slavery, to when we will stand at the mountain and receive the Torah. We will go from freedom from slavery and then have the freedom to enter into sacred covenant when we really become a community. And of course, our work is not just about freedom from. We're not just trying to escape oppression. You're painting a picture of what a repaired Rhode Island looks like. What does it mean to stand at the mountain and receive the Torah? Well, halfway through, when we're trying to get from slavery behind us and Sinai in front of us, our people hit a really big obstacle. The Sea of Reeds. Picture the scene. You've got Moses and Miriam and the elders and the tribal leaders and all the 600,000 Israelites who have finally, after 10 plagues, made it out of Egypt and they are about to become a free people and they see suddenly before them an insurmountable, impassable sea that they cannot pass and they hear the thundering hoofs behind them as the Pharaoh and his chariots and all of the uh, chariotmen are coming after them to destroy them. So they have the sea in front of them and Pharaoh behind them. And of course, what do they do? Moses cries out to God and starts praying. The people start arguing with each other. God yells at Moses, why are you praying to me? Do something. And there's this utter panic. And if you've ever led the Jewish community, you can imagine the scene. 5,000 years, nothing ever changes. Hysteria breaks out. Well, the rabbis in the Midrash, the stories that are taught of the text, teach a wonderful story in this moment. While Moses was busy praying and God was busy scolding Moses and the people of Israel were crying out, one man, Nachshon, started to walk. And as he walked into the water, up to his knees, up to his hips, all of a sudden, the Israelites got quiet. And as he got to the water up to his shoulders, Moses got quiet. And as the water got up to his nostrils, God paid attention. And the legend tells that when the water fully enveloped Nachshon, then the seas began to part. And the rabbis were teaching this about courage and risk and faith, that, that any one Israelite on any given day, even an Israelite you've never heard of, how many of you have never heard of Nachshon? Change the course of history by having faith. But here's the last thing I'll leave you with. 
I've been teaching that story for 20 years because it's a great story about being a hero, being a leader, taking a risk. And everybody in this room is a nachshon. You are the leaders who are walking into the water with faith, knowing that the seas will part, that redemption is possible, that poverty can be ended. You are an option, but there's more. I had a wonderful mentor of mine, uh, Rabbi Lane Zecker, who's in Boston, Temple Israel. She came up to me one day after I talked the story. She said, Jonah, you're teaching the story all wrong. I said, really? She said, you've got to read further in the text. The Midrash doesn't stop there. And if you look at Midrash Rabbah, the original source, the next words are Devar Acher, another interpretation. So another rabbinic voice comes forward and says, no, it wasn't when not shown in the water, but rather, it was when every Israelite, when every woman and man and child of Israel joined hands and entered the waters together. That's where the seas part. Join hands March forward, redeem yourselves, redeem Rhode Island, part of the waters, we can do this. Thank you so much.